What's happening, Hardscapers? This is episode 144 of the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today I'm joined by Joshua Gillo. He is the co-host of the Outer Spaces podcast. You should go check them out there. And of Yes Express, where he consults with business owners. We get into a lot of great topics on this episode. But if you need accountants, anything from bookkeeping to CFO services, you should check out Cycle CPA. They are specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry and you can visit them at cyclecpa.com mention how to hardscape and get two hundred dollars off we're going to talk more about them later in this episode but without further ado let's get into today's episode today i'm joined by joshua gillow of the outer spaces podcast this podcast that you should be subscribing to uh really great information there with joshua and uh duane drawn of the outer spaces podcast so definitely check that out as well as yes express a consulting group and sales academy there i'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about that in this interview as well josh thanks so much for joining me here man mike thanks for having me on man. i can't wait to to crank it out with you and have some fun Absolutely. Josh, let's get started to get to know a little bit more about yourself. How, well, it's such a long story, I'm sure, but let's break this up into uh, digestible chunks here. How did you get started in this industry? Where did you start from? Yeah, so it's actually all my mother's fault. I have to blame her for this because at five years old, she started the garden center because she was bored. Her two sons went to school and she was like, what the hell am I going to do? So she ended up rotting out the uh, windowsill, the bay window in the house, trying to raise plants. She just always loved doing that. My father's like, okay, well, we're going to build you a greenhouse so you don't quit <laughs> destroying the house. So I built a greenhouse and a uh, little one on the back of the actual house. And uh, she started raising more plants. And next thing you know, she was selling them. And uh, that was when I started kindergarten. I remember my kindergarten teacher being one of her first customers coming in and buying stuff. And so it was it was great. And, you know, back in those days, I, we lived in the country in Pennsylvania, out in the cornfield. So you know, it was a matter of trying to keep yourself busy. And once our customers started coming in, I started saying, thinking, wait a minute here, I see her making money. How can I make some money? Right. Cause we didn't get paid for anything. So I was like, what are you going to do? So I went out my little red wagon and I started collecting these cool rocks, anything I could find along the side of the you know fields or in the fields when they plowed after a rainstorm. And I started selling them to clients and or her customers. And, you know, it's where it all, kind of all started and then I would make a nickel and I'd be happy as hell. And that kind of graduated beyond that. So that's really how it started. Gotcha. And then you own a, a design build firm or a design firm. How, how does that work? Where does that fit into the picture here as you kind of progressed in this industry? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, I grew up in a garden center, my brother and I, he's about 18 months younger than me. And we grew up helping out in the family farm. And, you know, we never got paid for that. That was never the thing. We always had food there and we always did plenty of work. So we stayed out of trouble, that kind of thing. Right. But uh, eventually our clients, or I keep calling them clients because what I refer to all my people as, but uh, eventually her customers would come in and the customers would come in and start asking when we, you know, we came later in our teens and said, Hey, why don't, uh, why don't you guys come out and, you know, install these trees or these shrubs or build us a pond or these kinds of things. And I was like, sure, I can do that. We born on raising a farm. We can definitely do that stuff. So we started doing it. Dude, I'll never forget the first time that I got paid a thousand dollars for a day to work. I was like, holy shit, better than rocks, right? <laughs> so anyway, I was like, There's, we, we've got to be able to do more than this. So we started to learn about different things and hardscaping and ponds and lighting and landscaping. The landscaping obviously came easy because that's where we were. But anyway, we started to grow a business and we, we grew that family business for 15 years. You know, we had the garden center and we grew that business and it was great. We had a great referral lead source directly from the garden center. We did all kinds of odd jobs and, and all that good stuff. But uh, starting from the proverbial wheelbarrow and pickup truck, I borrowed my dad's pickup truck as F-250. It was a great Ford, like a 1988 or something like that. And uh, we just had a lot of fun and made some money. So that's really what it was all about. That was the starting point. And then after 15 years, I decided I want to become much more focused, right? Because uh, as I ran along, I was like, you know, I love building stuff and I love having the crews in house and all that wonderful stuff. But ultimately, what I really, really love is coming up with a creative idea for this space. So what if I could create a business where all I do is manage the idea, manage the monies, manage the crews, but not my crews, right? So I, so I started Master Plan, which is my design manage practice. So we design and manage outdoor living spaces all over eastern Pennsylvania. And it grew from an idea of taking all the best stuff from design build, getting rid of all the stuff that I didn't want, like trucks breaking down and people showing up drunk and all that stuff. Like that's all gone. And I'm like, now I guess to do the parts that I love. And the cool part is whatever I could come up with, whatever crazy shit that come out of my head, I could design it, get the client excited about it. If that was truly in their heart. And then the next thing I have, I'll go out and find somebody who only builds that crazy stuff. 
Like if we want to build a water feature out of core 10 steel, I'm like my guys before didn't have that skill. I'd have to go find, try to find somebody. Now I just go and say, all right, this is what you specialize in. This is what lights you up. Build this for me. And then come out and install it for me and just start building, you know, partnerships with people that way. And I've, that's been 10, almost 11 years now. And, uh, we're, uh, we're having a hell of a good time doing it. You know, just lighting people up and enjoying the process and helping them, you know, enjoy their families and their time more as they move along. So that's, that's my story in that show. Absolutely. Interesting. And you, you made me smile there because you said a thousand dollars in a day. That was my first side project. I actually, they wanted me to do a front walkway. I said a thousand dollars, not knowing how to price it properly. And then uh, when that was over with, they said, want to do the backyard? I said, sure, $1,000. They said, is everything $1,000? <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> so, love that. So that, that kind of made me smile there. Uh, that's really interesting, the design management style of business here. Uh, first off, how do you find, how do you attract clients for that design management uh, type work? How do you get the ball rolling with that? Because I figure it's it's a little bit easier or it's actually a little bit easier to visualize for a contractor, how they get that word of mouth going because it's their, what they're producing is, is physical, it's in their space, the neighbor can come over and see it, or their family members can come over to see it. A design is a little bit different in that sense. How do you get the ball rolling when you decide to start a design management firm and to start to get more clients attracted to your business? No, that's a great question. And it's something that most struggle with when they start thinking about this transition, because they love the idea of having less headache. But uh, the, the secret to all of this, Mike, the secret sauce here is you need to control the idea. That's the secret sauce. So if you're not the kind of person, if you're a guy, you're you know a, a gifted installer, an artist that just loves to get their hands dirty and do the work, awesome. Stay in your lane, keep killing it. But if you're somebody that is more about handling the idea, like my, in my, my DNA, it's about creation. It's about design. It's about making things better than they are right now, right? And trying to constantly think about how can they be improved? That's, that's a constant, you know, uh, mouse in my head running. You know what I mean? Constantly thinking about how can things be improved? How can they be slightly better? How can the customer experience be better? Constantly focused on that. So when it comes to controlling the idea, if you are have design in your heart and you're like, look, I really want to do this. I love creating cool stuff, but I don't necessarily want to get dirty doing it. Then you can do this kind of a model. But if your hands really want to get dirty, this is not going to be the right model for you. So with that being the case, when you control the idea, clients come to you for that idea. And to be quite honest with you, dude, I went through some head trash in the beginning thinking like, oh my God, how am I going to, how am I going to get other contractors to show up to my job sites? And when they show up to my drop sites, my, my customers are going to be confused. Like, why is XYZ landscaping showing up? It's not master plan. Right. You know, I don't understand this. Or why is a hardscaper showing up when it's not master plan? Like, it's, you see all these different people. And you're like, how are you ever going to sell that? How are you ever going to say, hey, pay me so I can bring my buddies over and work on your property? Right. That's really effectively what you're doing. And that was one of the biggest challenges in the beginning is to get over the head trash and realize it's all about the idea. Come from the perspective of your prospect. Come from your client's shoes. What are they looking for, Mike? They're looking for an amazing outdoor living space or whatever, fill in the blank, whatever they're looking for. They came to you for it. They don't care whether your trucks with your emblem show up and do it or whether somebody else's trucks show up and you're managing, but you need to be the constant in this project. You need to be the constant throughout. So if you're managing the idea, now, if you're doing, you know, paver walkways, things like that, it's just going to be a little tough of a sell. It's when you start getting into a more, um, connected like fragmented pieces like you're going to do a walkway you're going to do a, a retaining wall you're going to do landscape lighting you're going to do the, a nice big patio in the back as well you're going to get into a deck you're going to get into a roof now those are they don't have to all be there but the more you can put into one package the less the client has to go out and find all those people for you you've done the work for them hence your value you've done all that lift for them they don't want to make a bad decision and most people that are spending anything more than $25,000 they don't want to go do the legwork to find all the right people. And then on top of it, they're busy. They're so busy. They don't have time to be a project manager, nor do they have the expertise to do that. You're filling that gap for them. That's a huge value add. So you ask how you do it. You add a ton of value and you know your place. You know, you're not going to be out there sodding lawns. You're not going to do it with that. It's not going to make any sense. No one's going to call you to give you additional money to just manage people when they can do it. It's a one-off. But when you have that, that consistency of, of not even consistency, when you have that that uh, that design or you have that idea that requires multiple talents to do, that's when you can add value because you can assemble a team. You're basically a coach assembling a team. Yeah, 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, design is one thing and being a good designer and being a, a quality designer is one thing, but you're also adding that value of you've already vetted these contractors, which I think for a homeowner is the number one most difficult thing to do, as well as just the biggest headache. So mm -hmm. you, you're you already solving a lot of their problems. And I, I feel like the clients coming to you, these are the clients that want the outdoor space, the full thing to come to you for their uh, larger scale clients, I would say, not that client looking for like a side walkway solution. So already you've put yourself in this boat where you've got the clients that you definitely want that are willing to spend their money and are willing to pay for a design as well as for somebody to manage these contractors on their site correct 100 percent, dude and you nailed something there that a lot of I, when i started out dude i didn't do this either pay having your client pay for design that is a gigantic piece that's a huge qualifier that's a huge Huge, huge, huge piece. And in the beginning, I didn't, dude. I was just happy anybody would say yes to me. So I'd do, I'd just do it for free. And then eventually I got tired of being used and watching my designs being built by my competition. I just was not into that shit anymore. I wasn't playing that game. So I eventually said, look, I was the first in my market at the time to, to charge a design fee. It's like 500 bucks. And I, I'll still remember it. It was, it was old school. Though. This is before all the computer stuff and, and all that. Um, it was vellum. So it was like the thin paper that you can see through. It's a vellum. It's a drafting paper. I could get a sheet of that. 24 by 36, I would then sketch out the house on it to scale. And I'd use these little rubber um, ink things for landscape plants. So I'd lay out the hardscape by hand and I'd take these little rubber things and then I'd put them on there to show them the plants and I'd make a little legend and I'd stamp it and I'd color it all in. That was like the whole thing. That was my design. Yeah. And that's how I started. I charged 500 bucks for those. And if the client wasn't going to do that, and I did it as a, a deposit toward the project. So the client didn't feel like they were gonna, ever going to be taken out. They're, they're working toward it. My goal was to sell the project anyway. My money's made on the on the actual build, not on the design. It's just to make sure they're not wasting my time. So that sounds good. We get that, get that rolling. And it was a design, you know, a deposit toward the design. So then they were getting that back when they started the project, which obviously we all know that that's built into the project, right? So that worked for many years. And I eventually kept creeping that up. And I, I started to think, all right, wait a minute here. And this is what we teach our students is, Guys, if you're doing design, figure at least $100 an hour. You're worth that or more from your experience. Maybe you're not a designer right now, but your experience that you bring to the table is worth a hell of a lot more than 20 bucks or a handshake or nothing. So just say it's 100 bucks an hour. And if it takes you three hours, it's $300. Have something there. And if you want to use it as a deposit toward the project, that's a great way to start. But the longer plays, you'll have a design fee, which doesn't go back to the project. And that is just you recapturing the time that it takes to do that. And if the client splits either way, you're still getting paid. That's the main thing. If a client doesn't value design, and we find that most clients need to design over about $25,000, right? If the project is below, below that or it's a one-off, then you can probably get away without a design. But over 25, you start getting a more integrated project where you have multiple pieces coming together. Maybe it's that seating wall, the fire pit, the patio, you know, the landscape and the lighting. And if you get into pools or whatever, fence, like all of those things, once you start getting that integration, that's where the value is for a client when it comes to integrating and connecting with a design managed partner like us. With that evolution from going from not charging for designs to charging for a design fee that's that goes towards the project to actually charging for designs, I feel like that's a very typical uh, sort of progression for mm -hmm. learning learning how to actually ask for that design fee. That's where I am actually. I started with not charging for design. Now I'm actually charging for designs. And I hear that all across the board. What do you think is holding people back from charging for that design? If they think, uh, you know, their experience is not worth it or anything like that. Like how, how do we overcome that? Especially like I, I come from the mind. I'll just tell you my, my thought process. Then you can go off. This is, uh, if you're just starting out, I think it's valuable to offer some sort of value add. If you don't have that sort of, uh, prestigious company built up or some sort of branding in the area for your business, you need some sort of value add. And I think a design is a good way, as long as it doesn't take you too long and you're not spending hours and hours every night on it, a, a quick design is a great way as a value add to say, hey, we offer free designs. And that kind of gets the ball rolling for your company. It's a good start, but you got to get out of that as soon as possible. What's your thought process on how we get out of that? And if you actually even agree with that, Josh? Yeah, so dude, I'll, I'll lay this out real simply. The reason why most people and the reason why I didn't charge for design 
is because I didn't value my ability. And if you don't value your ability, you can't possibly have someone else pay for it. The day you become a designer is the day you say, I'm a fucking designer. It's that simple, right? I don't have a degree in this. I've been doing this 25 years. I don't have a design degree. I don't, I'm not a landscape architect, none of that bullshit. I have a PhD in common sense and work ethic, right? Sweat equity, grit. That's what it takes, right? So if you guys out there listening saying, I'm never going to get that. It's not me. That's good. It's not me either. And it's been, that was some of my mind caca, if you will, in the past was thinking like, man, I need to hire a landscape architect and I can finally charge the amount that they would be able to charge. It's all bullshit. It's all mindset bullshit. Your, your brain is trying to sabotage you. Don't listen to it. I am sure if you can go out and build an amazing backyard for somebody, even if it's a simple patio, seating wall, fire pit, whatever, that you have the ability to learn how to use a basic software to show someone, to, to illustrate through a visual communication, a design, what it's going to look like. Because when you do that, you get the confidence that comes with that as well. When you're standing, you're not trying to visualize with words and paint a picture. And then your picture in your mind is different than your client's picture. And next thing you know, then you build the project and they're not happy. And then you're like, oh crap, you got to go back and tear this out. They don't like the way this curve looks or the circles aren't big enough or whatever it might be. So stop that crap. Start thinking about adding as much value as possible. And the way you do that is by locking in the idea and then offering some options. Say, look, Here's what you asked for, but here's what you could have. And not go crazy. If they're not asking for a pool with a grotto, don't freaking do it. Simple, right? But maybe you say, all right, they didn't talk about lighting, but let me show you what lights look like in here. How about a walkway or pathway to the front, to the, to the driveway? How about uh, maybe they didn't talk about a seating wall. Maybe that's something you want to add in there, right? So you can suggest ideas, but offer them softly. Say, look, this is what you asked for. This is what you asked for, but here's what, I, here's what else we can do. And that's how you start building that value. But if you want to become a designer, you got to just say, look, I'm going to learn the fundamentals. We teach that in our courses, the fundamentals of design, a formula, a winning formula so that you can go through. You can learn how to design. There's certain techniques, certain things. And it's not this heady bullshit where, you know, on the, you think all the, the long haired freaky people come out and have to listen and all these big words that are confused people. And, oh, we got to talk about balance and we got to talk about, you know, uh, whatever, like all these stupid designer terms. No one cares about that. What they care about is what can you do for me? right? What's in it for me? So that if you can get there fast with your client and show them visually and also be able to do that uh, through a good conversation, dude, you're in. Like no one else is doing that. You automatically get a shoe and whether you know what the hell you're doing or not, it's almost dangerous <laughs> you know what I mean? when it comes down to it. But you know, the big thing here is to make sure that you can see value in yourself. And the way you do that is by, well, first off, charge. You want to become a designer, charge for it. You put money on the table, you become it damn quick. I have this philosophy, you know, a lot of people think in life that it's, you know, life is a lot about readying, aiming, 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 and then firing when everything's perfect. Dude, if you, if you work with that, as most people do, you will not go very far, especially in business, in life too, but in business. I learned a long time ago that the proper way to look at this is ready, fire, aim. Because once that bullet's moving, you got to chase it. That is your momentum. Because you know what? You've already charged for that design. You have to show up with an awesome design. There's the burn the boats mentality with that thing. You, don't have, you can't come back with some stupid little design. Like you're going to come back and you're going to try to show your worth. You're going to be like, look at this thing. Even if they don't like it, it doesn't matter. The point is you're going to put all of your effort into it. And that's when you can start becoming a designer. It's when you finally say, look, I'm going to charge this because I know I'm worth it. I know my, my experience in life is worth it. I know I have something more to give. That's when you become a designer. Yeah, I love that. Take action, you know, just just do it and you'll be surprised when the first time you do it and you say your price for the design and the client says, yeah, OK. And and then like getting that first one and and hearing that response and not an objection, it just it's like a, a weight is lifted off your shoulders and then all of a sudden you're a designer and you're a paid designer. So that mm -hmm. yeah, that's huge, right? And in most places, I don't know of any that aren't, but you can call yourself a designer. You don't need to have any licenses for that and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not like a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer. Like they actually have to do that stuff. But as a designer, it, it, it doesn't matter really. As long as you're a good problem solver, that's the goal. Why does it have to be that you're super good at CAD or super good at this or that you went to a school for that? All that does is build confidence. And if you can build confidence in the streets and the trenches, dude, you're going to be much further ahead than the ones that are coming out of school that don't know a damn thing. They can't tell a shovel from a rock. They, don't, they just don't know because they're, they're taught inside of a classroom philosophically, not actually taking that information and actually implementing it. 
we see it coming, you know, when we're interviewing different people, designers, especially, you know, coming in and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, this sounds good. I can definitely do this kind of stuff. Have you ever done it? Have you have any field experience? No, 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 no. But I know exactly how to do it. What's that? That's a shovel, right? It's not a backhoe. It's a shovel. You know how to use that thing? It doesn't come with an instruction manager. You know how to use that? I never touched one of those before, right? I'm being crazy, but you get the sense, right? Yeah. I would rather have somebody who has, has the, the work ethic and the mindset and no skills in design and bring them in as a designer than somebody who isn't, you know, that has all these skills that come out of college. They couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag because they understand it philosophically, but they can't do shit with it. So, so. you decide to start a design management firm and I, I'm going to make assumptions here, but please clarify and talk to me how, how this developed. Uh, I would assume you start in your immediate area, but nowadays you're, you're servicing a much larger area. Uh, how do you go? What's what's the progression in terms of where those leads are coming from over time? Are you focusing in on paid ads? Do you, are you in certain platforms where you see leads come in uh, today? Is it all word of mouth? Like, how has this progressed since you started? Yeah. So starting out, you know, I started out with, with well, I had the experience for 15 years of the family business. So that made it much easier to get started because I knew, let's put it this way. I was much more confident than I was in the very first business when I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. The second one, you start off faster. You can, you can leapfrog yourself, which is great. Now starting out for me is I had contacts, you know, in that world, kind of like you did, you know what I mean? You had some contacts to get started with. So we just kept rolling with that. And eventually they dry up like, okay, that's good. But they know the person. They know the, the dynamic of the person. So like, hey, I'm gonna, if you're doing this, I trust you, let's do it, right? So I started off with a couple of projects that way. But most of the stuff was, I focused a lot of money on website, right? This is 11 years ago, right? And and website back then was important, but so, most people in our industry were just throwing up their pictures. It was like a scrapbook for them, right? And they just a little bit of drivel about how awesome they are and about you buy, 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 buy from me and all this stuff. And I'm like, I want to be different. I want to do something totally different. So I hired a web guy and I spent probably more money than I should have at the time. Uh, it didn't really matter because I got the results that I wanted, right? I had, and then another big thing here, dude, that this guys write this down. If you're not, if you're driving, don't do it, but write it down. If you aren't hire a professional photographer, that was one of the first things that we did was hire for a professional photographer, a couple hundred bucks a shoot. They know the right light. They know the right timing. They know all of those things. They're going to capture those pictures because your clients are not going to be very happy when they see a, you know, they see a picture on your website that looks like it was uh, you know, taken on a Thursday afternoon after a rainstorm with dog shit in the yard. And you just happen to drive by and clip it quick on your iPhone, which was half foggy because you didn't wipe the lens down. And then you're trying to sell bigger projects and you wonder why you're not getting anywhere, right? I say this because that used to be me, right? I'm sitting here making fun of myself, right? But anyway, I said, look, we got to hire somebody. So you, uh, so we hired a you know professional photographer. He came in and he shot a bunch of really good pictures and that became the essence of the website. If you want to take a look at a lot of that, you can look at our website. It's mymasterplan.com. You can see what we're doing there, right? So just professional pictures. But here's another little jewel I'm going to drop on you guys listening. Not all photographers are created equal. And here's what I mean by that. Obviously, we know everybody's a different personality. But what we found over the years, I can't believe I'm sharing this kind of like by one of our little secrets. But anyway, what we found over time is that men or the masculine energy, we won't get into the deep energy stuff, but men or the masculine energy, they see things certain ways. And they see very structural. Average, not everybody, but average. So your photographers that are male, they're probably going to be more focused on structure, connection of materials, the materials interacting with the environment, that kind of stuff. When you have those same people shoot people in your designs or people or interviews, that kind of stuff, it's more, let's just say it's not as soft as it would if you had a female or a feminine energy. And again, male, it doesn't matter. It's not a sex thing here. It's, it's feminine. It's, it's masculine and feminine energies. So anyway, so what we found is that we hire our our masculine, if you will, photographer to come in and he takes all these awesome pictures of structure and things like that. So the men that are looking at the website automatically connect with like, wow, that's really freaking amazing. And then we hire a female or a feminine energy uh, person to come in and actually her, what she does a lot of is boudoir pictures, right? So she's good at capturing human essence. She comes in and she takes most of the kids and the family pictures. The difference between the two is night and day. If you had the female doing the the, you know, the more uh, material shots and the guy taking the, the, they're totally different. We've done it. They are completely different eyes that are, and both of them are awesome, but just for different things. So if you want to put people in your picture, pets, that kind of stuff, 
grab, grab a female, someone with a heavy feminine energy that can come out and do this. That does people pictures all the time. That's where you're going to get your best pictures. So yeah. just want to drop that on you because that was something that took me 20 years to learn. That's, that's interesting. I, yeah, I don't think that's so controversial to say that, you know, in general, men are more interested in things and in general, women are more interested in people. So having yeah. that emotional attachment to an outdoor living space, because let's get real. I think that's one of the biggest things I've picked up since starting my podcast and doing these roundtables is that if you're building outdoor living spaces, you're having it shot, have people in it because that mm. has an emotional attachment to that living space as opposed to just like you said, photographing uh, things and structures, which is incredible, but having having a people and showing how that space is used provides an emotional attachment to that space. 100%, dude. No, let's put it this way. If, if your potential client is looking at your website, social media, whatever, and let's just say your, your hell yes client is, is uh, you know, a family, two and a half kids, don't ask about the half, but two and a half kids, you know, they're somewhere between 35 and 55. They're probably either in healthcare, finance, or they're entrepreneurs, whatever. Like you figure out your own, um, you know, dynamic, your own profile for your ideal client. If that's the case, why the hell are you showing single people in the backyard that are partying with friends? Let's just be crazy. Like why they're, they're not connecting subconsciously with the pictures you're showing. And I know a lot of this is over people's heads because they're thinking like, how do I even get people in my pictures? Like, oh my God, how would I ever ask my client how to do this, right? We'll get there in a minute. But think about when you're, if you know your ideal, we call it the avatar, right? We talk about finding your perfect hell yes client or your avatar and then thinking, all right, well, if that person is what I mentioned before, uh, maybe their average you know, median income in their house is 250 plus thousand, whatever, you fill in the blank, right? They drive two cars, they, their, their hobbies are they go on vacation with their kids that this is their forever home like there's a list of things you figure out who the perfect and the way you do this is think back about the last three or four clients you work with that you're like man i wish i could just clone those clients man they always paid on time they pay me what i was worth they love my ideas they refer the hell out of me like how do we find more of them you find more of them by showing them in the narrative that you're talking to your client about through your website, through your social media, you talk about them. You talk not necessarily those families, but you talk about that lifestyle. And that's how you pick it up. You, they start to connect with you like, wow, okay, these guys are talking about me. Mm -hmm. It sounds crazy. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but it's really quite easy when you just boil it down to its barest components. Now, bigger question is, all right, great, Josh, I'm gonna get some people my designs, that'd be great, but uh, my clients don't do that shit. They're not gonna do that. Like, there's no way. How do, you, how do you get them to say yes to that stuff? Well, this whole concept of reciprocity. Now, if you don't know what that means, I'll break it down for you. Reciprocity is you doing so much for somebody that they feel indebted to you, and not in a, in a servant kind of way, nothing like that, but you've done such a great job for them. You've over-delivered so much that when you go back to ask for something, they're like, oh, dude, of course, I'd love to help you. So think about what you're doing now and figure out how you can possibly add even more value. Maybe it's, for instance, an example would be people hate getting permits for projects that homeowners hate to get them. So you do it. You take care of that for them, right? Uh, that's why we like to do that. That's part of our value add. Another thing might be managing certain parts of demo that they might not want to do. Like we can take care of that too for you. Like you just start adding more value and you're like, Hey, you know what? I'm actually going to, by the end, we're going to take some pictures throughout this. We're going to create a little shutterfly book for you. Like cut these things that they don't expect. That's how you're going to build reciprocity when they get them. Like, Oh my God, like all I expected was a walkway, a patio or whatever, fill in the blank. Uh, but now they, what they want above and beyond. So now I want to go above and beyond for them. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way. You don't even have to ha attach money to that. You can simply just do it out of the kindness of your heart. And then you can go for your ask. You won't feel guilty at that point. It's when you go in and you know, you under, you know, undersold the project. So you can get it. You try to cut corners everywhere you possibly could so that you can make some money in this job. Then you feel guilty going in and asking people for more. Cause you know, deep down that you really don't deserve it. Right. So, but when you're over delivering, constantly over delivering to your client, thinking about the customer's experience throughout this entire thing and making the best it can be going and asking for that's easy. Yeah. Just going in and you can say, look, you know, guys, what we find is that uh, we love serving families just like yours, thinking they're ideal, right? So families just like yours. And would you be open to the idea of maybe having, I'll send my professional photographer just a couple of pictures of you guys in the backyard. I mean, the ultimate goal is to have more families like yours discover outdoor living so that they can spend more time together outside as a family too. Are you guys open for that? How many people do you think are gonna say no to that? Right. 
We don't, we don't get many push, many people pushing back from that. Now here's another side that is, and I'll let you get on with the story here, but some people just aren't photogenic. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> let's let's just call a spade a spade. You're like, you know, I'm probably not going to be great on the website. So if that's the case, or they just have a weird personality or whatever, you might want to offer the option to have somebody else come into that project to be the family, right? And we do that too. We'll, we'll stage families in there. We stage furniture, we stage all kinds of stuff because we want to get that look. You don't want shitty furniture from, from Sam's Club that's got a broken leg, you know, chair with a broken leg sitting out there just because that's what they have. We move things right off the patio. We bring in new furniture that we we uh, uh, borrow from one of our furniture designers and she lets us borrow stuff. We have an agreement and, and anybody can get an agreement like that, by the way. It's not hard to do. Uh, anyway, and set it up staging because we want it to be the best because if our clients are looking at the website, social media, and they're like, wow, that furniture looks amazing in there. That space looks so comfortable. They're much more likely to your right client will most likely call you up, right? And you're not you're not battling at the bottom and trying to be the race, you know, to the cheapest price. These are all things that you can do uh, in order to improve your value to the client and have them see themselves out there. So when it comes to trying to get people, you know, other families in there, again, the same same thing. You ask them, and if they say no, like, no, nah, we're not really we're not really people that want to do any kind of video work or photography. I'm like, okay, cool. Now, I know this is a big ask, but would you be open to me bringing in some people that I know in order to be the family to set up back there? Because ultimately what we want to do is help improve other people's lives. And when they see people in the pictures, they connect better. And when they connect better then more families are served, not just from us in general, and they're going to be able to uh, um, you know, help other families do this and create spaces just like you love. Dude, they say yes every time, yeah. right? Because you're showing them what's in it for them. They get to be good humans. And of course they're going to say yes. If they're, if they're, if they're just asshole bricks, don't even ask them. There's not even a point, but most people that are commonsensical and, and, uh, and good people are going to be fine with that. No, I went on a deep one there, but that's, that's some of the stuff we learned that really helped us launch that. I just want to take a moment to talk about cycle CPA right now in your business. You want accurate bookkeeping and financial statements every month, but instead you're often left with limited time to focus on the accounting side of your business and no reports to show for it at cycle CPA. They not only handle the bookkeeping, but also provide landscape and hardscape industry benchmarking, job costing, super important financials by service line, advisory meetings, and so much more. Cycle CPA's team of accountants can do anything from bookkeeping to CFO services. And they're specialized within the hardscape and landscape industry. So if you want somebody to take care of your numbers to help you through that process so that you're not coming home late at night after a day on the job site and having to do this, visit CycleCPA.com and for $200 off, mention the How to Hardscape podcast podcast now back to our episode i'm a big fan of value ads especially throughout the process but especially at the end when you can leave a lasting impact and it, going about it that photography route where you've probably already budgeted that into the pricing for that and offering you know a photo album is really nothing in terms of uh what it costs you but the lasting impact that it puts on the client is way more than than what it costs you with that uh and you also mentioned there that if you if you price a project wrong and you have to cut corners which you shouldn't you should just take a loss on it but it causes you to have to second guess on the quality that you're putting in and having to fight against that budget but if you if you price a project appropriately, you're able to do these value ads for your clients. So if you think that undercutting the market is doing a service for yourself to get that project as well as your client, you're actually wrong. You need to be priced accordingly. Uh, and, and then you can go above and beyond for your clients. That's how you go about it, right? Dude, I'm going to drop a nugget on you right here. Something I learned from a guest on my podcast and just the way that he handled it, it was, it was really good. Anyway. What is the right price for a project, Mike? Like for a paper patio, whatever. Like, what's 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 the right price? Yeah, it's right. It's, it's all it's objective. all completely up to interpretation. Yeah. It's, it's what is it? Is it your market? Is it the material? Is it your your skill? Is it your installation ability? Is it your your experience? All like all these. Like, what is it? And the price of your project, the way you price it, is based on how much the market will hold. That's what your price is what the market will hold. Right now, the market's stupid high. That means it's going to hold stupid high. So if you're still sitting at the bottom fighting for scraps, you're missing a, a, an opportunity of a lifetime right now, mm -hmm. right? So keeping that idea in set, 
thinking about, all right, how much is that going to be? And this kind of, I don't want to fight with those other people in competition, really thinking about the fact that you can charge whatever you want for your project, but you need to deliver at the end of the day, you need to deliver what they're expecting. You're setting expectations and you're delivering expectations. That's what it is. It's not a price war. That's not what it's all about. When they see these pictures of, of families and all of that, they're like, holy crap, they've already leveled up right then and there. And if you don't have those, start working on that kind of stuff. But think about it as the market itself is what is what dictates the cost of the project or, or not cost so much, but the sell side of the project. And it's not what the neighbor's doing, what the other guy did. Because if you bring enough value to the table, we've been the most expensive in our market for years. We have no problem selling projects. None. And the reason why we don't is because we bring so much value that they're thinking, we call it a value stack. We teach that in our class too, but it's a value stack where we have a conversation with our client. And by the end of that conversation, they feel like they're going to pay a million dollars for what we're going to do. And it's like, it's only a hundred grand. They're like, oh shit, sweet. It's, it's, it's simple. When you understand how to craft a structured conversation with somebody that is authentic to you and that is authentic to them, you'll understand their struggles, their pain points, and you can nail it down to a point where you're just having a conversation. You don't have to learn a hard script where you're like, all right, now I'm queuing up for the next objection. Like, oh, wife's not home. Oh, what would she say if you bought right now and had to deal with it later, basically, right? Yeah. Oh, well, she'd probably divorce me. That's fine. Sign here. Like, you know, it's like these hardball <laughs> tactics that just... Oh my God, you just need to take like a Clorox shower after saying stuff like that. I just, I can't, I can't do it. I've never been able to do that stuff. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that well, I'm going to back that up. I'm probably the worst salesperson you'll ever meet. The worst. I hate selling with a passion. I hate selling, but I love helping people buy their dreams. Mm -hmm. That's what I love to do. I love helping people buy their dreams. And that's the core of our entire teaching is that, that focus how can we make it a win-win scenario so that I can go out and talk to people, have conversations, and it just happens as a result in an actual swapping of cash. Go to bed every night, my heart's full, everybody's happy. You know, I don't have to sit here and think about the next way to kind of screw somebody out of money or come up with some other strategy to try to figure it out that I'm smarter than them so they'll pay and then they'll get then common sense will kick in. And the next thing you know. I've got to deal with a client that's pissed off because they spent money they didn't even want to, but I, I coerced them into it. Mm -hmm. And now the, the wife doesn't want it or doesn't like it that I'm dealing with this toxic environment all for money. I mean, it's the lowest form of currency, Mike. Money is the lowest form. So why the hell are we struggling over it? Why are we fighting over it? It doesn't make any sense. As somebody that doesn't consider themselves a salesperson either and hates sales, how did you become better at sales? Is it something as simple as connecting with, uh, it's simple, simple to say, hard to actually do connecting, making that connection and being good, a good communicator. Uh, because I've, I've honestly sat down with clients and said, Hey, I'm not a salesperson. I'm going to present this design to you as if this was my backyard and the features that I would want to see in it. And this is why I would want to see these features and just trying to connect with them as, as human being to human being. Um, how, how did you go about becoming a better salesperson and to bring sales into your business as somebody that hates sales? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, that's a loaded question. We could have an entire three yeah. hour podcast on that one, <laughs> but I'm going to try to, to, to boil it down. So how do you do, how do you become that salesperson when it's not really something you want to do? That's a bigger context to your question, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So <sighs> If you're trying to be something that you aren't in life, it'll come through very clearly, right? The authenticity is what we see and what we feel from somebody else, authenticity. So if you're not being authentic, it's going to come through really quick. So most humans want to help other humans. Can we agree on that? Yeah. Yep. Right. They just want to help. That's why we got in the business. We can make money helping people and we can do something that lights us up. We get to go from a pile of rocks to an amazing space. And then we can see that families enjoy it, right? That's what lights me up. That's what lights a lot of us up. So how do you help people buy that? Feel a difference between that and saying, oh, I got to sell something. Yeah. One thing you get to do and the other one you have to do. So imagine if you get to help people buy things all the time. That small shift in mindset, do you feel a difference? Yeah, absolutely. Right? So do you have to learn anything at this point to be a good human? No, nope. you really don't. It's already there. You already are enough. Mm -hmm. We just have to think about how we're communicating, what words we're using, yeah. what, what, what formula, how are we one step before the other? There's a certain process. There's a certain set of things that must happen. 
in order to get to the result you want. It's, it's, it's human nature. We're mapped out that way. They've mapped the genome. They map minds. So there's certain things that have to happen. Here's an, existent, or an example. When oftentimes, and this is how I started too. So I'm not making fun of anybody out there that does this. This was me back in the day. Uh, somebody would call. I'd be knee deep in mud on a patio project, whatever. I'd pick up the phone because everything came to my cell phone. I would pick up the phone and I'd be like, hey, what's going on? Mrs. Jones tells me, I want to do a paper patio. Sounds great, Mrs. Jones. How's Tuesday at five? Sounds perfect. Great. Click back in the pocket. That was my screening process. Mm-hmm. That was it. And she did that probably five other people in the next hour. And then we all lined up bumper to bumper, five, five, 15, five, 30, five, 45, right? We've all been there. And I get in there and I'm like, there's, there's no added value. I'm going to come in just like every other one of these guys. But I didn't know any different, right? I was taking calls on the site and all my advertising one place, blah, blah, blah. But right? it was just so convenient. The problem is when I'm out there working in, on site when I was, my mind was in getting shit done, not in sales, yeah. all right? So if I said, this has to stop, I can't keep doing it this way. So I made a pack that I would never take calls on site anymore. And I bought a cell phone, put it in the office. It has its own number. Everything is wired to that. It's chained to that desk. It does not leave. And then I would schedule throughout the week, two or three time segments that I would return calls. I'd have a nice message on there saying, guys, look, you know, we're out in the, we're out serving another family, building an amazing outdoor living space to, to have, bring them together and make them, uh, you know, enjoy life more. We can't wait to talk to you about your project. So we'll be back in touch with you here in the next 24 to 48 hours. Hold tight. We got you mm-hmm. and reach back out. Right. So that immediately took that pressure off. So I could be getting shit done in that mode. And also then flipping the hats, going back in the office on a scheduled time and actually having those phone calls with the clients. Right. So that was, that was a huge change right there. I'm not always just, you know, gunslinging every day. Uh, but as far as to get back into the sales thing, how do you become a salesperson? <laughs> You just unlock it within you. Everybody has this. I don't care if you're introverted. I consider myself an introvert, crazy enough. You know what I mean? I consider myself that way. I get done peopling at the end of the day and I'm done with people. You know yeah. what I mean? So as much as I'd like to say that I'm not, that's just who I am. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, if you're coming into a conversation with a client, knowing that you have a tremendous value, if you will, a brick of gold that you want to bestow upon them, you want to give them, you want to help them through knowledge. It's not selling anymore, dude. It's trying to help them live a better life. And who doesn't want to do that? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously there's got to be a a, a money's changing hands here to make this happen. We just have to change our mindset around money. We got to change our mindset around things like budget. You know, that's one big thing we hit on in our, in our classes where uh, there's a three-step process. I guarantee you'll get budget on the phone before you ever leave every single time. And you're going to like it. It's fun. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Think about that. Most people don't <laughs> want to talk about that. They don't want to talk about budget because they're afraid if the client will give you a solid number, this is the mindset, a solid number. Because if you say, client says, I've got 20,000 to spend, you're thinking, oh, it's only going to be 10. I'm going to charge them 20 because I've got 20,000, right? That's what a client's thinking. If I give them a number, they're going to take advantage of me. And us as designers, we're thinking they give us a number. That'll be plenty until we start designing. And then we realize that we're off by 50 to 100%, right? Mm-hmm. So how do we let go of some of those mechanisms so we don't have as much stress during the design and the whole sales process? This should be a value add. Sales is a value add. It's not a process to get somebody to buy. It's something that you work with your client as the guide and bring them through a step-by-step formula that by the end, they're either wide open, ready to go, ready to sign a check, or they aren't all before you ever turn the key and burn a drop of gas. Yeah. That's what we specialize. Yes. Express is doing that. I 25 years of beating my head against the wall. I hired a sales coach who I told you before, beat the hell out of me. You know what I mean? When I came to uh, dude, you got to listen to yourself. You got, you're not doing it well. You're not good in front of a camera, like all these kinds of things. Right. So this is all, it took all of that to get to a point where I'm like, holy crap, this works incredible. We double, double sales in a year with this system. I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. And then I, that's when I, I actually met Dwayne. I actually reached out to Dwayne. I'm like, Dwayne, you do a similar thing out in, uh, in Chicago land area, design and manage. How about you jump in here? I want to teach you something. He's like, cool. He was cool enough to say, yeah, go for it. We taught him, he doubled. And I'm like, well, wait a minute here. Like if, if the rest of the industry doesn't have to waste 20 some years to figure this out and we can teach them in seven short weeks, a few hours a week, seriously, like, why wouldn't we do this? Why wouldn't we help people? So that's, that was the whole culmination and the kind of the birth of Yes Express is to be able to help people communicate better and do it from an ethical heart-based center where you can spend more time with your family and less time with people who are trying to rob you of that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with everything you just said there. There's nothing worse than being sold to as a as a consumer yourself, going to a car lot or anything like that. And you can tell, you know, these people are salespeople. Uh, they're not necessarily looking to help. And you feel that when you leave that lot. And uh, that's huge. Like, if you go into the mindset of you are wanting to help these people, these people are actually worse off if you don't do the project for them because you know that you are the best company to be able to do that project. You need to be able to help them along that process because you, you they would be worse off if they don't go with your business, right? As long yep, as it's yep. ethical and as long as you're helping and that's your focus on it. 100%, dude. I want to go back to something that I want to add to the yep. last thing we were talking about, about cost, right? Here's a little zinger for anyone out there that thinks lowest cost or lowest you know, price is going to be the best way. And I know that's how I started too, dude. So I'm not throwing rocks in a glass house here, right? So point is, the more you charge your client, not to take advantage of, but the more you charge your client, the better tools you can buy, the better education you can get, the better crew, the better team you can assemble, the more money you can put into figuring out how to help your clients more. So when you charge more, you're not just helping yourself, you're helping every single person around you. Those same team members, you can now give bonuses to, they'll stay around. You can send them the furthering education because you have the money to do so. So by going for the lowest price, you're not just screwing the client, you're screwing yourself and your future. Mm -hmm. By going as high as the market will allow, it allows you to create the team, to buy the resources, skill sets, all the stuff that you need to do things you never dreamed you could, but you can't do it without the money. You have to charge even more than you think you're worth so that you can do that for others. I look at business simply. Business is a vehicle to help others to their dreams faster. Definitely. That's how I that's that's how I see it. And my success in life is to bring as many people up with me as I grow. It's not about me being on top and looking down and saying, ha, 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 look how much I did. Thank you for all of your weekends and nights away from your family so I can go on vacation and I can buy the big house and you can kiss my ass with my brand new Shelby Mustang going out the door, right? So they can sit there and live in squalor, not knowing if they're going to be able to make their electric bill or if they're going to be able to pay for the food or whether they'll ever take their family on a vacation. That is unacceptable. You must help others lead a life the same or better than you're leading. When you do that, you will build a team that'll go through anything with you. Shift that mindset. Everything changes. Great stuff, Josh. Uh, I do have one quick question that, that I, I had way back in, at the beginning here. Uh, before we kind of close things off here, it's kind of a 180 about what we've been talking about, but you deal with a lot of different contractors. How do you go about getting these contractors is it a trial and error thing? Do you reach out and network with other people and ask them about contractors in the area? You're, you're a design management company. That's a huge part about it. How do you vet contractors? How do you get contractors uh, that you trust and will actually use on a project? So the way you vet and find good contractors, uh, your best bet is if you already have a distributor that you work with, say, for instance, you go buy papers somewhere and you don't want to do papers anymore. You love landscaping instead. Go there and ask them. They know who you are. And they'll say, who do you think would be a great fit to do this kind of work? Just start work with what you already know. Nice and simple, right? From there, I'm a huge proponent of this. If I only work with people that are men and women of their word. Word is, is the, the, the material that I use, if you will, the currency that I use. Uh, because if somebody is a man or woman of their word and they say it and it's done, they say it and it's done, you don't even need contracts. I'm not saying don't get contracts. I'm saying there's there's an, a trust factor built in because you can always trust that person's word. And that's what contracts typically do. It's trying to say, look, you told me this and you're going to do that. But if people just do it, there's less need for that kind of the, 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 the nervousness and anxiety that comes from these kind of engagements. So again, I'm not saying don't get contracts. I'm just saying make sure that the people that you're working with are men and women of their word. You can do that pretty simply. You say, all right, look, new contractor, you want to, and we call them specialists or partners. We don't use the word contractor, especially not subcontractor. Clients have a very, very nasty uh, association with that because it's like, oh, you're handing me off. They don't like that. But they go to their doctor. There's a specialist, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's all in the wording, guys. It's all in the wording. So you're doing this. You're going to vet somebody. You give them a task. You say, hey, dude, I, can you have this patio price? You fill in the blank. I need it by Friday at four o'clock. All right, sounds good. Send off whatever you're going to send, whether it's an RFP or you're sending them an email or somehow you're doing a takeoff sheet so they know what they got to bid. See what happens next. 
the people who really care, they're going to ask you questions because they want to get it right. They're going to say, all right, well, I see this is your base profile. This is what you want. Uh, what's our access point or whatever it might be. They might have some questions because they really want to do it right. The ones that just submit a bid and act like they've never seen you before, dude, you're going to just have a train wreck of problems on that project, or they're going to lose money one or the other. And you're not going to have that connection. You've got to be thinking win-win here as well. Here's another big nugget. When it comes to working with them, it's your goal, going back to my premise of always helping others grow with you. It's your goal to grow that other company as fast as you're growing. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. So if you're like, look, you're going to come in here and you're going to build my patio. Probably a better example would be decks, right? A lot of hardscapers, they don't touch wood. I get it. So they don't touch wood. So I'm going to get a deck guy involved. Let's start working with the best. Let's start talking. And let's see if they can hit this. I'd say seven days for a proposal to come back. And let's see if seven days it happens. Let's see if they ask questions. Let's see what happens. We, that's how we vet our people. It's very simple. Do they have it done by Friday at four o'clock? Is it early? Is it detailed? Because if they just say deck $5,000, there's a high probability that's how they work too. They don't really give a shit about detail. But when they lay it all out and show you what's included in it, this doesn't always work, but for the most of the time, this is what we found is work. Um, when there's a lot of detail, there's probably a lot of detail in their work as well. Definitely. So just be mindful of those kinds of things. Give them tasks, give them hoops to jump through and see what they do before they ever swing a hammer, before they ever dig a hole. And you see what kind of the communication is because guys, look, they're on their first date with the first proposal they're giving you. If they suck in their first date, you can ask for a second. Mm -hmm. And another little trick, uh, trick is get two or three people your first time out, find two or three people. Because if you just go on one track and chase one train and they turn out to be a, you know, a bogus, at the end of that, you're stuck starting again. So if you have two or three in the pipeline at the same time, you send it all out the same day and say, hey, there's three people, let's see what happens. Sit back and watch, see what happens. See who asks questions, see who engages, see who cares, see who's in it to win it and who just doesn't give a shit. And then from there, you're probably going to go through, I don't know, two, three, four, five, ten, till you find one. And that one might work for a year or two. Then they switch their goals and they're going somewhere else. It's okay. you got to constantly be thinking about who else can you start adding in an A team, a B team, a C team as you're moving. You just got to constantly keep evolving that thing because you don't want to ever get stuck with your pants down. I have a project that you have sold and they're like, I'm oh, sorry, dude, I'm going to Vegas. I'm not doing yeah. this anymore. I'm sorry. I'm sick and tired of it. Cause you can, they can up and leave your crews. You're the one controlling them, but they can leave too. Mm -hmm. They can up and go to Vegas just as fast. So there's no, <laughs> you know, insulation in that. The fact that you roll them or you know, run them and don't worry. Another thing here before we finish up, don't worry about their truck showing up with their names on it. Some people are really freaked out about that. We don't even own a vehicle with a name on it. I got one truck. And, I, and has no name on it. I don't even own a shirt with my logo on it. We do millions a year in sales. I don't have any of that stuff. Amazing. My, my goal is always to be different than everybody. That's just how I've always rolled. And it's, I, I've proven it over and over and over again that it's not necessary. Not that you can't have that stuff, of course, but it's more about the value to that customer experience. That is really where it all lies. Josh, if we want to improve our sales, our sales process, become better salespeople, what is what is Yes Express? What is what do you offer there, and and what how can that help us along the way? Absolutely, no. And thanks for asking that. So Yes Express, like I mentioned before, you know, was was basically a culmination of twenty five years of of black eyes and broken bones and all the stuff that happened and learning things, going and reading a book or going to a seminar and implementing something, then it works for a week or two, then I get a big no from some of the crap that didn't work, blah blah blah, down through like all of this stuff. Um, so what we have is we have a couple of different options for you if, if you choose to, to engage. Uh, we have what we call our sales accelerator, which funny enough just drops today. Uh, it's a one-step process. For anybody that's doing projects that are one-offs, that are, when I say one-off, I'm not trying to talk down to it. I mean, I, I was that for years. But if you're doing just retaining walls or just a patio, you don't need to have a really deep conversation with a questionnaire and like all these other things that you'll need when you start designing, right? So we have the, uh, the sales accelerator. That'll help you get there faster. It's one step. It's basically a 10-minute phone call. We have it uh, all structured for you, uh, but you'll have the no problem going in there and adjusting it to make sure that you get your personality through it. You're not going to be some robot that someone, you know, you're not going to sound like me. Let's put it that way. It, it's a framework in order for you to sound your best. So you can ask the right questions at the right time in the right order. So you can get the best results and either keep that client and have them grow into an amazing, you know, client that lasts many, many years or broom them and get them out of the way. So you can get on to the next one to your next ideal client. So that's the accelerator. That one there is, is everything's on a platform. So you go on and you watch this content and there's worksheets, things like that on there for you. Um, from there, that's that's for projects 25,000 and less we find because most of the time those projects don't require an actual design. Uh, 25,000 and more, that's where we get into the design. And that's where we have our sales mastery program. That's focused on getting 
uh, a deeper conversation played out. It's a three-step process, right? So the first part is initial call coming to the office. How do we take that? That's the highest level of filter. You know, do we even offer what they're looking for? And we have a uh, conversation we have with clients to set the expectation. If you can set expectations on each step, each touch for the next one, you just keep building that. You're building trust. You're building confidence. You're building everything. People love process. They pay more for process. So this is a process. They're going to feel it as they move. They're not just here, but feel it. So questionnaire goes into, or it goes from the initial call to the questionnaire, which we already have pre-built for you. You can use that goes deeper. Are they willing to do some homework? If they're willing to do homework, there's a higher probability they're going to become your clients. If they aren't, they won't do homework. That helps them. If you just say we require this questionnaire, people are going to be like, screw you, dude. I'm not doing it. But if you say, guys, look, we found in the last X amount of years in business, we get the very best results when our clients take a little bit of time and take a look at this and give us all the information we need so we know we can knock this project out of the park. How many people are going to say no to that? All right. Everyone's going to say yes because they can see what's in it for them. Mm-hmm. Then we go into a discovery call. It's about a 20-minute uh, discovery call with a client. But we never even left the office yet. And by then, we'll know at the end, we'll know budget. We'll know what they're most motivated to move forward with. We'll know what they've done so far. If other people are looking at this project for, uh, you know, they're bidding other people out. We'll know all kinds. And that's just the beginning. Just like touches all the way through. Again, we'll get budget and those three easy steps. And we're also at the end going to have a commitment from that client to make sure both of them are ready to move forward and ready to pay for design. If they say no or they push back, we just don't go any further Definitely. until they've made a decision because there's no other choice. That's how it works, right? And we do it in a very ethical, very fun way. And then we go to discovery meeting. We, we actually walk you through the process of, of how to go out and meet these clients. So that's, discover, right. that's the uh, sales mastery side of things. We also have uh, design mastery where we teach you the fundamental formula on how to design an outdoor living space. We, our famous line is stop selling paper patios and start thinking about designing outdoor living spaces for your clients. There's so much more to that. And people resonate so much more to open their checkbook more and you get a lot cooler stuff to build. So we teach you how to have that conversation through the, the sales mastery side. And then we show, you, we show you through this formula how to design outdoor living spaces, like three zones, making sure you have those well allocated outside, making sure that you have architectural connections, seamless transition, uh, lines of force, all these things that are, that are so uh, fundamental to great design that you don't have to have a background in this shit. I don't either. Right? I don't have a background in this stuff. These are things that we developed over time and that we've learned from others. We've put it together. And, and again, it's a seven-week process. You're going to spend about two hours a week on this, not whole seven weeks. You're not going to class. Everything's online. We do live classes, both sales mastery and design mastery to make sure we lock in what you learned. Because if you come in and spend thousands for a course and don't get shit from it, I'm not interested in that. We're only interested in transformations for our, our students coming through and for our clients for that matter too. We're not interested in transactions. Make plenty of money in our design managed practices. This is a passion project for us. This is trying to help change an industry that we love and trying to help everybody as, as the tide rises, all boats rise. And that's how we see it as well. That's why we do the podcast. That's why we do these things to be able to help more people so they don't have to suffer like we did. Um, and the last piece here for you, we have a, uh, a frontline mastermind. So my, my uh, I should say our uh, uh, design managed practice master plan, Becky, she runs master plan. She's been with me now seven years. She is a critical member of the team. She takes care of the whole front line, everything, right? But she has so much that she'd love to give. So we started a mastermind for women only. So if you're listening to this and you're a woman and you wish you had some support on the front lines, managing the customer experience, managing ARAP, uh, problem customers, systems, processes, taking phone calls, like all of these kinds of things that happen on the front lines of our businesses, reach out. We'd love to chat with you. You can reach out to us at hello uh, at yes.express. That's your best way to reach out through email, hello at yes.express. And uh, we can get you in the right direction if this kind of thing sounds good for you. But again, it's a female only group. They don't even let me in there, Mike. They won't even let me in. It's like a girls only group, but they go in, they go some deep stuff. And we do it on Fridays so that during the week, they can kind of take all the stuff that all the pressures and things that keep coming back up and they can let it out, talk. How did you solve this? And it's not just us dictating. It's all the girls in there talking about how they solve the problems too. And everybody wins. So uh, that's all I got for you as far as that goes. So if that sounds interesting, hello at yes.express. And I've pushed this interview to its fullest extent here, but uh, Outer Spaces, you should go check out that podcast. What can we, if we're going to tune into Outer Spaces, what are we going to listen to? What are we going to learn about, Josh? Uh, yeah, so Outer Spaces, it's all about connecting business and mindset and passion all in one spot, brother. That's what it's all about. Awesome. Any closing comments, anything that you want to leave our, our uh, audience with, uh, anything else? And I'll leave it to you there. Man, it's, oh, well, there's so much I could drop, right? But at the end of the day, guys, <laughs> what I want to get into everyone's head is you're never going to show up one day perfect. 
right? So perfection is an illusion, especially as a designer. And I'm a recovering people pleaser, right? So with that being the case, you know, you're never going to be perfect. So just work with progress every day. Just grow a little bit, learn something new, listen to a podcast, think about how that could change your life. You are already enough as you are right now. All you need is direction and guidance, and you can get somewhere that you never thought you'd be able to get to. And not just for yourself, but for your family, for your children to be watching and seeing their father or mother growing and being happy and coming home full and present. That's what life's all about, dude. We live for each day because we never know how many more we're going to get, right? And yesterday is a figment of imagination and tomorrow is a worry that may never come, right? So let's live in the moment now. Let's enjoy it. Let's just live in love and peace and really enjoy everything we do for for what it is and just find the value and blessing and everything. So that's what I'll leave you with. Josh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure, brother. Thank you for listening to today's podcast episode. If you aren't already subscribed, go check out the Outer Spaces podcast for more from Joshua Gillo there. And if you need a team of accountants to help you with your bookkeeping or CFO services, we've got Cycle CPA for you. They specialize in the hardscape and landscape industry. Visit them at cyclecpa.com and get $200 off when you mention the How to Hardscape podcast. And we look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast.